Good morning. This is Rex Bernardo at the University of Minnesota. Thank you for joining my class and me this morning. Uh, this is agronomy, officially Agronomy 8202, Breeding for Quantitative Traits in Plants, a class I teach at the University of Minnesota. I thought I'd give a seminar today. This is actually my first PowerPoint presentation in class. And I thought I'd open it then to our department and our campus here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, but then I got requests if it can be forwarded and I said, yes, for sure. And so I'm pleased to see uh, the number of participants we have. We have about seven, 170 plus and growing. A few things before I start. Uh, first is that I have turned off your microphones and I have, uh, you, you don't really need your video, but a reason for that mainly is the rash of Zoom bombing incidents we've had. In fact, there was a meeting, a uh, plant breeding meeting that I read had some Zoom bombing. Uh, and because of that, I also turned off sh uh, screen sharing so you're unable to share the screen with the participants. I also had to turn off the private, uh, the, the chat. You can send messages to me. And in fact, later on during the question and answer, I think that would be the most uh, efficient way is if you simply write your question down in the chat and then I can see it and read it uh, and try to answer your question. Uh, you might also hear some noise in the background. I hope that's okay. I'm here in downtown Minneapolis and there's quite a bit of construction going on this morning. Um, so with that, I'd like to talk a little bit about a quarter century of genome-wide prediction. Uh, this is a bit of history, uh, if you would, as indicated in the title, of how this procedure, genome-wide prediction or genomic prediction or genome-wide selection or uh, genomic selection came about. And so it's a little bit of history, a little bit of the work that has been done primarily that we did here at the University of Minnesota and a little bit of looking forward uh, as well. So to start, just a minute here, okay, there you go. I'd like to thank uh, Ji Wu at the uh, Washington State University of this slide. Uh, Ji Wu put together this slide that details a little bit the progression that we've had from MAS or marker assisted selection uh, to today's uh, genomic prediction. And it's depicted here as sort of a river. And the marker applications at that time, as indicated, by, uh, were, it started upstream with marker-assisted selection for quantitative trait loci. However, in 2001, Theo May Wisson and Ben Hayes and Mike Goddard published this paper in genetics on the use of genome-wide markers for prediction of total genetic value uh, or total genetic merit. And this ushered then a, a large amount of research on the use of genome-wide markers uh, to predict uh, performance both in animals and in plants. Uh, it turns out though that before that, as depicted in that little island in, that, in this river over here, uh, back in 1994, I did work on predicting hybrid performance in maize using restriction fragment length polymorphisms, using a procedure that eventually became known as GBLUP. And as we know later on, uh, GBLUP and uh, procedures such as ridge regression BLUP, as introduced by May Wisson et al. Were, were found to be equivalent under certain genetic assumptions. And so if you might be wondering why I'm saying a quarter century of genomic prediction, it's because I'm counting back to 1994 instead of 2001, 1994 being the first use of GBLUP, of genome-wide markers for predicting performance. That work was obviously in the plant breeding world, uh, the use of genome-wide markers uh, for estimating relationships. Uh, this was implemented by Dale Van Vlick in his package MTDF Reynel. Uh, that was later on. Uh, Paul Van Raden in 2008 developed methods to uh, uh, calculate kinship uh, from these data. Uh, and then later on, several iterations of these procedures uh, were then used. So again, I thank uh, Jiwoo for this slide, historical slide. So looking back 25 years, Again, the first case of genome-wide prediction uh, was with research I did in maize in, back in 1994. Uh, the ideas uh, were, this was a combination of different ideas that have been published. First is the use of BLUP, best linear unbiased prediction 
uh, of non-additive genetic merits by Henderson. Uh, and then Michael Lynch, who was at the University of Illinois at that time, published this paper on estimating relatedness by DNA fingerprinting. And it so happened that when I was working with a seed corn company, a uh, problem we had or an issue we had was pr predicting hybrid performance uh, of those hybrids that are, are not tested because there are just too many to test and we cannot test everything. But we wanted to test the performance of those hybrids uh, that are not phenotyped. Uh, and so therefore the idea was simply to use molecular markers, RFLPs at that time, to measure relatedness and then to use this relatedness in traditional BLOP in a method again that later became known uh, as GBLOP or genomic best linear unbiased prediction. Uh, at that time, I, I think uh, the word prediction wasn't quite used uh, as well as it is now. Uh, that happened in 1994, back in the era where the focus really was on the use of QTL or marker assisted selection. And that was the time of the era of QTL mapping in the 1990s, which has led to some very wonderful results of uh, finding QTL, major QTL for uh, traits uh, such as submergence tolerance in rice, as indicated by this sub one QTL that has been widely deployed, as well as another example is the FHB1 QTL for fusarium head blight resistance in wheat. And so looking back, I think we have found that for traits for which there could be major QTL, such as abiotic and biotic stress tolerance, we then use QTL mapping. But for traits for which we surmise there aren't uh, major genes, then we use a predictive process, uh, such as mainly genomic prediction. Again, as I indicated, uh, genomic prediction, genomic selection uh, was ushered in. Um, uh, in large part by this paper by May Wisson and Hayes and Goddard in 2001. Uh, we began, we began, uh, Jen, Jen Mingyu and I, a former student, former postdoc, began initial simulations in plants to see, does this procedure have merit? And this was uh, an article we published in 2007 on the response to selection with phenotypic selection or, or with uh, genome-wide selection, GWS, or what we call at that time as marker-assisted recurrent selection. So in marker-assisted recurrent selection, we're selecting based on markers that had significant effects on the trait, as opposed to genome-wide selection in which we do not do tests for significance, but we simply uh, determine marker effects and select based on all the markers. And we see here that the first cycle of selection here was based on phenotypic selection. And from simulations, we saw that if we select based on all markers, we have larger gains compared to if we select based on the significant markers only. And we see here that phenotypic selection takes three years, whereas if we grow the plants in a warm uh, year-round nursery such as Hawaii or Puerto Rico or a greenhouse, we can grow up to four generations of, uh, of corn per year. And again, the advantage is uh, even though phenotyping in the greenhouse or Hawaii is not meaningful for our home environment, the marker data stay the same, even if we grow the plants uh, in the greenhouse or the winter nursery. So this told us that there is promise indeed in using genome-wide markers for predicting the, the value of individual plants and selecting individual plants based on their uh, predicted performance. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Paul Van Raden developed uh, the methods to efficiently co compute genomic predictions, and this has been widely adopted in the animal breeding world to the extent that today uh, it has been argued, and I think it is true, uh, that GBLOP is the genetic evaluation method that is most widely used in livestock improvement today. Uh, in 2009, a PhD student and I, Benson Lorenzana, uh, published this study looking at empirical data and trying to see, we, we had done simulations, now let's, let's look at empirical data and see, are the predictions with empirical data actually better than based on, say, multiple linear regression that looks at significant effects? And this is in maize. And uh, we, we see indeed, as indicated in this bar graph, uh, the bars to the right are predictions based on, uh, on ridge regression blop. Uh, 
Uh, the bars on the left are based on multiple regression using significant markers. And we see that indeed, if we make predictions based on all the markers, we have a higher correlation between predicted and values and underlying genetic values than based on multiple regression. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but this might have this might have been uh, the first study that did this sort of procedure looking at empirical data in plants and looking at the cross validation results that has become quite popular today. Uh, Benzlin also compared different models. Uh, just to, so the, the bar graph to the left uh, is the simplest model, no epistasis. The second bar graph has epistatic effects and it's basically increasing complexity. The bar graph, the bars to the right are the most complex models. And the take home message from this slide is that we are better off with predictions based on the simplest genetic model assuming no epistasis and if we actual if we model epistasis or interactions among mark well, due to marker effects the predictions actually suffer and our conclusion is that that does not mean to say that epistasis is not present what we believe that is saying is that the data that we have in terms of sheer numbers of uh, individuals in the few hundreds the data sets are not big enough for us to ad adequately model the epistatic interactions. And because of this limitation in data sets that we typically find in, in plant breeding in general, that we're better off using the simple naive models that we know are biologically incorrect, but that work, that work anyway. As the famous statistician said uh, that all models are wrong but some are useful. And so we're, we have here a model that is wrong, but is useful nevertheless for predictions. Uh, in about uh, in the early 2000s, our group here at the University of Minnesota got access to a large set of data from the Monsanto breeding company and to which we are extremely grateful for access to those data uh, because they have allowed us to do types of work uh, that we normally don't do, cannot, that we would not be able to do. Uh, the data is worth millions of dollars. Um, and I'm thankful again to uh, the colleagues at, at Monsanto, uh, collaborators at Monsanto who allowed my students and me access to this data set. Uh, we were granted access to 969 biparental populations in maize. Each one had been evaluated in multi-location trials. Each one had more than, usually more than 100 lines developed in each population, genotype that more than 100 markers uh, and with, with marker imputation, more than 3,000 markers. And so this allowed us to do a, a series of investigations on how to best use genome-wide markers in the context of a line development program. Uh, in, in maize. And so Lian, a uh, student of mine, studied the distribution of predictive ability in maize for different traits in different populations. So on the right uh, is yield, then we have test weight, uh, and then stock lodging, root lodging, and so forth. Uh, the second and third uh, box plots are for uh, estimated relative maturity and grain moisture that are relate very much related to each other. And so we see a few things here. One is that, uh, yes, there is quite a distribution about the mean uh, prediction accuracy uh, for each trait of yield uh, across the 969 populations. The mean prediction accuracy uh, is, is 0.25, uh, that's a correlation. But we see quite a bit of variation among, among, uh, uh, among the populations. And so I'd, li I'd like to say that, well, if you are a PhD student and instead of studying 969 populations, you were studying three populations and you happened to study these three up here, you'd be really happy with your results and you'd say, wow, the procedure works really well. However, if you were so unfortunate and you happened to study these two data points in the bottom, you'd say, oh, the procedure does not work at all, and you'd be worried whether you'd be graduating or not. Uh, in fact, the accuracy here is negative for these data points over here. But when we look at the whole picture across these populations, 
uh, we see then that genome-wide so, uh, prediction on average works. It does not always work, but on average it works. And if we use the procedure routinely, it will work for us on average. Uh, we, started, we started doing investigations with recurrent selection uh, with real plants. And this is the first study we believe that reported the results of recurrent selection uh, with real uh, plants instead of uh, mainly simulations. Uh, this is John Massman, who's now with uh, uh, Corteva. I would like to focus on this last graph. Uh, this was a USDA funded study on improving uh, corn for cellulosic, cellulosic ethanol uh, quality. Uh, and the cycle of selection here indicates, uh, the, the, the range here indicates the time scale. So from cycle zero to cycle one, uh, that was phenotypic selection. And then from cycle one to two and two to three, that was marker-based selection. And we see that then that for the Stover index, uh, the top graph is for using all the markers and the bottom graph is using only the significant markers. That if we have selection based on all the markers, that indeed we see uh, nice gains uh, in, in what we're selecting for. Here, when we select for yield and stover, uh, there's actually a decrease in performance between the second and third cycle. And, and so basically what we're seeing is that this, this procedure is effective, but perhaps the, the, the best gains are not all achieved in, in that cycle. This is when we measured the responses due to wet chemistry rather than NIR. And we see here that when the, the, the using all the markers is still superior, but we actually see a decrease uh, in the wet chemistry results. And we attribute that to, well, we're actually selecting for cellulosic ethanol, which changes the calibrations for NIRS. So yes, we, we basically have good gains for what we select for, but actually we're, we were changing the profile. And so that means that the, uh, uh, the calibrations may not have been valid after a few cycles of selection. Uh, but to the bottom line is, as breeders say, you select what you get for, and and, and you you get what you select for. And we were selecting for NIR-based uh, uh, ratings, and therefore we see that positive gain. Another student uh, uh, and I did some follow-up research this time on using genome-wide markers to try to intergress exotic germplasm. Uh, the exotic germplasm in this case is dwarf corn. Uh, this is me in my cornfield, and these are mature. Uh, these are plants that flowering, and you see the dwarf corn is about waist high. Uh, the idea is to develop corn uh, that is of short stature and that matures very quickly, and to grow them at very high plant population uh, densities, just like we do small grains. Uh, just to focus here, uh, we see here observed versus predicted yields. Uh, and then, uh, although again, there is uh, uh, some difference between observed and predicted yields, we do see a general downward trend in the use of genome-wide markers uh, to select for plant height. Uh, we're seeing that when we select for indices, uh, particularly with, re with indices uh, with regard to that use ranks, then the, then the results are a bit more erratic than what we would expect. Um, we wanted to know then, can we predict the prediction accuracy? Before we conduct the experiment, can we determine whether the prediction accuracy would be high or whether uh, the prediction accuracy uh, would be low? And so uh, this is a study conducted uh, by Emily Combs uh, and, and I back in 2013. And so this is from the same mapping population. So because it's the same mapping population, the LD structure was the same, the number of markers was the same, the size of the, of the training population was the same. And what we did was we tried to vary heritability, to make heritability equal by adding diff, uh, the right amount of noise so that the heritability for each trait becomes the same meaning that if you have a trait with high heritability, you add random noise so that in effect, the phenotypic data have a lower heritability. And this is what we found. We found that for even when all other known factors were the same, 
that the traits differed in their prediction accuracy, which means that for some traits, some traits simply inherently have a higher prediction accuracy than other traits in the same way that uh, phenotypic selection, for some reason, heritability is high and phenotypic and, and heritability is low uh, for other traits. Meaning that it really is quite difficult to predict the prediction accuracy in advance. That being said, we know that there are different factors that affect prediction accuracy, and we want to control these factors to the extent that we can. And so Goddard um, published this equation saying that the expected correlation between the true genotypic value and the uh, predicted genotypic value is a function of n, the size of the training population, of h, uh, of the trait heritability, and the effective number of chromosome segments. In fact, uh, more specifically, it's it's a function of the product of your size of the training population and the trait heritability, which quite interestingly is the same factor that affects the power to detect QTL. Meaning that for a trait with a high heritability to maintain the same power, you need a smaller uh, training population. And for a trait with a low heritability, you can get, uh, you need a, high, a larger training population to maintain that same power. This equation here assumes a perfect LD between the underlying markers that are found in these effective number of chromosome segments and the actual molecular markers that we have. Uh, Lian and I modified this equation to account for an imperfect LD between the QTL and the markers. And so we basically have that R squared or the LD between QTL and markers, which makes sense if you have zero LD between QTL and markers and R squared of zero, then we should not expect uh, a, predict, a positive prediction accuracy. So we then said, okay, we know R, we can estimate R squared, we know N, we know H, we can even back estimate, we can back estimate um, the mean uh, across all populations, the mean effective number of factors. If we know all of this, can we predict the prediction accuracy? And the answer is no, we cannot. On the left, you see a cloud of points that's using the Detweiler original equation. On the right, we have uh, assuming an un unsaturated genome of an imperfect LD between markers. And this Y equals X line indicates that unity value if the predicted prediction accuracy is on the X axis is equal to obs the observed prediction accuracy. Basically, we can predict the average, but there's too much variation about this average for this uh, to, be, to be meaningful uh, in any way. So with that, again, I guess we're, we're back to having rules of thumb uh, that would help us in, de in determining what the, predict what the training population should be like in order to maximize the prediction accuracy. We then tried, uh, this is Amy Jacobson, a PhD student who joined me uh, 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 later on. Uh, we then started to investigate the use of different types of training populations in maize breeding. So maize breeding in a nutshell is, is structured as follows. You cross two parents in bred A and in bred B. You could induce doubled haploids from among F1 plants or among F2 plants. And then because it is a hybrid crop, uh, these lines are tests are, are evaluated not for their performance as lines themselves, but for their performance in hybrid combination with a test, tester T. And then the lines are selected based on their test cross performance. And if J and K perform well in test process, then we select these lines uh, as new inbreds. So given the structure of a uh, maize breeding program, <clears throat> we try to determine where, uh, where, where are the points in this breeding program in which phenotypic selection is ineffective. Because if we can use genome-wide markers in those stages of the breeding program when phenotypic selection is ineffective, those should be the stages where we could have the most advantage or the most gain. And we determine, <coughs> excuse me, that the effectiveness, that genome-wide selection uh, is the fertile ground here is selection among F2 plants. Because a maize breeder cannot select among F2 plants for hybrid grain yield. It's two things. First of all, a doubled haploid line 
uh, is developed from the F2 plant. And then this uh, doubled haploid is, is tested for hybrid combination. And because of that, again, phenotypic selection on F2 plants has zero value in terms of hybrid performance. And so therefore, that is a place, in fact, I would say the place in maize breeding where, geno where genome-wide predictions have the most value. And so to do that, uh, we can think of some, some uh, uh, different breeding, some types of training uh, populations. Uh, one is we figured, well, if you use that same cross between A and B, that would be the best possible training population in terms of relatedness because these are full sibs, these are highly related to the doubled haploid lines. And so that would be the best possible training population. We figured that if you use, if we use lines that, that are related to A and B, that can be a good training population because of that relatedness. We figured then that a better training population is to use all prior crosses that had A as one parent, and all prior crosses that had B as a parent to pool all of these prior crosses with A as a parent and B as a parent and use that pooled training population to predict the performance of doubled haploid lines in that A by B cross. So basically in this best, you could think of it as having a full sub structure in this better, it's a half sib structure. In this good, it is neither a full sib nor a half sib structure, but they are a group of lines related to A and B. In terms of N, your A and B is your smallest, your, your, your uh, A, A slash uh, A star and star B would be larger, and then A near star dot star would be your biggest possible uh, training population. For brevity, we call that the A by B model the GCA for general combining ability, and then the SB for same background or same genetic background. And here is what we found. Um, this I'm focusing here on grain yield. This is not predictive ability. I repeat, this is not predictive ability. This is the gain from selection that we would have from different cross validations in uh, metric uh, megagrams per hectare. So across these populations, with phenotypic selection, we get 0.25 megagram per hectare in gain. If we make predictions based on the full SIB model, your A by B model, your gain is a bit lower, 0.18, compared to phenotypic selection. If we select based on the pooled half SIBs, uh, we have 0.19, which is uh, equal to uh, with the full SIBs over here. However, if we select simply based on a common genetic background, we see that the gain is quite lower, significantly lower, 0 0.07 compared to 0 0.19 with a GCA model and 0.25. Uh, the advantage of the GCA model is that it uses prior data and obviously with the A by B full SIB and the phenotypic selection, you actually need to evaluate the individuals from that cross itself. You can then ask the question, well, what if we pool the A by B individuals and this same background individuals to have a much larger uh, uh, training population? And if we pool that same background plus GCA model, we see that that actually doesn't add much. In fact, the gains are numerically smaller in this larger population compared to just the GCA model. So these results have begun to show us that relatedness is the key factor that affects the effectiveness of a training population for a given test population. The idea here then is that each test population would have its own ad hoc training population. That instead of choosing your training population, you actually first ask the question, what am I trying to predict? And based on what you are trying to predict, you then create an ad hoc training population that is designed only for that test population. Meaning that to predict A by B, I have one test population. To predict C by D, I have another test population. These test populations are a subset though of a larger uh, data set, uh, historical data set. <clears throat> Uh, Amy also found that marker imputation works and it, it, uh, it, uh, it increases the value of the predictions. Uh, we see here in the A by me, B model, the imputations increase slightly. Uh, with a GCA model, the uh, imputation 
uh, increases uh, the, the, the response to selection to the extent that it was no longer significantly uh, different from the response uh, to phenotypic selection. <clears throat> and so um, uh, this was quite interesting. Uh, again, the LD within a biparental cross is really strong, it's really high, and large chunks of a chromosome are passed intact from parent to offspring. Amy's, Amy studied different numbers of, uh, of markers and, and found that you can get away with 30 or 40 or 50 markers that are genotyped in the cross and do the rest by imputation. And I said, well, if we can use only 30 markers, maybe we can go back to isozymes. We don't need DNA markers. We can use protein or biochemical markers and not even have to do DNA extraction and use the isozymes that were developed that became prevalent in the 1970s. I did find later on that the chemicals to do isozyme analysis are no longer available. So yes, we do need to do DNA marker analysis instead of isozymes, even if we don't need that many markers to start with. The previous results we had were based on the assumption that in the SB, same background model, we used pretty much the same size of the training population. We had that restriction. So in this case, this, this number of crosses in the GCA model or half sib model was the same as in the same background model. Uh, a student and I, Sophie Branderis, took a step back and said, you know what, that's really an unfair assumption because if you look at the same background model, it can be as huge a data set as possible. So we said, what if we, we take away that assumption and basically use all the data available to make predictions and not have that artificial restriction of equal sizes of training population between the same background model and the GCA or, or the half sib model. So the same background model had uh, on average about a training population size of 50,000 lines. The GCA model had an average about 10 times less, so about 45,000 lines. And we can, we can pool, actually pool the GCA model, the SB model and the GCA model to have our maximum size of training populations of 55,000 individual crosses. And here is what we found. We found that the GCA model across different traits, these are responses to selection, and on the next is uh, predictive ability. The, the, the response to selection was still greater with a smaller GCA population than with a larger uh, same background populations. So again, relatedness was more important than the size of the training populations. We, uh, Sophie also did different filterings of that same background model, meaning what if, what if we filter in the same background model only include those that are most similar to what we're trying to predict and that really did not make any difference. So again, we're seeing here that among these different factors, when you come up to a training population size, uh, that, the, that uh, relatedness is what really is the key that drives uh, these predictions. Um, a student of mine, Lisa Marie Kirchhoff, did further investigations on training populations in maize and basically found that if you do not have cross-validation across individuals, um, you have an upwards bias in predictive ability, and we, we knew that, but we also found that if we do not have cross-validations, Y is equal to years, if we do not have uh, cross-validations across years or environments, it is possible that we are also inflating our predictive ability. So this told us that yes, it's important to do cross-validation, not only with individuals, uh, but environments as well knowing that that indeed becomes limiting if the number of environments we use in our study is not as large as we would like it to be. Lisa Marie also found that the testers are important. In the previous investigations I've shown, we've always used the same tester. However, if you use different testers, then the, the predictive ability uh, decreases. <clears throat> I've thought of how I begin to, began to think of how can we use genome-wide markers for ways other than selection. And one way is to use genome-wide markers to cor correct for background effects in QTL mapping, uh, linkage mapping, or association mapping. 
So if you look at different QTL mapping methods, perhaps the most common method used is CIM or composite interval mapping, in which selected, a selected number of cofactors, say five to 20, are used to correct for background effects. Or in association mapping, you have the QK model where Q accounts for population structure, K for kinship, and it uses kinship to account for uh, relationships across all chromosomes. I, I thought that a way to do that is actually to use genome-wide marker effects from RRBLOP to account for the effects of markers across the genome. Meaning that if you are looking, if you're scanning chromosome one for QTL, what you do is you use the genome-wide marker, effect, genome marker effects on chromosomes two, three, four, five, six, so for all, all the background markers to cover or to account for all the effects in that background. Then when you're scanning for marker for QTL on chromosome two, you use all the markers on all the remaining chromosomes to account for that background information. And so I call this then as a G model that is useful for both linkage mapping of QTL and association mapping. And from simulations, I found that the, you have better power if you use the G model for QTL mapping than composite interval, interval, interval mapping. For example, here for a fairly uh, reasonable size of the mapping population, the black squares uh, indicate the results for the G model. The, uh, the pluses indicate uh, the res I'm sorry, the, tri uh, the pluses indicate the results for composite interval mapping. And in overall, you have a slightly higher power to detect QTL if you use the G model. Uh, I found the same uh, results with association mapping. Uh, if you use a simple model with no correction at all, uh, you have a whole bunch of false positives that you detect. The Q model is not as effective as the K model. If you use the QK model, on average in these simulations, three QTL were detected, but they very uh, good control of your false QTL. The G model was able to detect more QTL uh, however, the, the false positives were slightly higher than what you had uh, for the QK model. So I think a nice feature of this is that um, it, it really unifies. It unifies the uh, methods of finding, of finding marker QTL associations. It does not matter if you have a biparental cross or a uh, association mapping panel anymore if you're using genome-wide markers. And you also do not need to account for kinship or, uh, or population structure, because genome-wide markers should be able to account for kinship and population structure, because if genome-wide markers cannot account for those, then you'd argue that nothing else would be able uh, to do that. Um, if you do have major QTL, uh, it's possible to combine major QTL as fixed effects uh, in, in, your, uh, in your predictions. Uh, I found, uh, this is a simulation study in which uh, look at how much gain do we have if we account for QTL of varying effects, a QTL of 50% uh, R squared on the trait down to 5%. And no surprise, uh, the, the advantage of uh, uh, the percentage here indicate the response, the percentage response when we incorporate that major QTL as a fixed effect versus the response when we do not put any special treatment or give any special emphasis to that major QTL. So if that QTL accounted for half, 50% of the variation, if heritability was 0.8, then we get 12% greater response if we consider that QTL as having a fixed effect as opposed to we just have it as a random effect like any other QTL. So, so the bottom line is if you have major QTL with large effects, on the, meaning with large effects on the trait, the default procedure should be then you simply treat those QTL as having uh, fixed effects and the other uh, QTL would, would have random effects in your uh, prediction model. A student, uh, Elizabeth Liz Blissett, looked at this uh, in the context of um, Apple breeding and actually she also investigated what if we fit dominance effects in our model. So Liz found, well, 
the simple model works just fine, fine in apple, that despite it being a highly heterozygous species, fitting dominance effects does not make any difference. Fitting major QTL does not make any difference as well. Uh, we could argue, well, it's big, perhaps that major QTL did not have an effect large enough. And we saw that for this first data set. And without going into the details, we saw that in this second data set as well. Again, no, if, no, no influence of having dominance effects or including major QTL uh, in the prediction model. There has been concern of what happens if we use genome-wide markers, what happens to genetic diversity? Because after all, we're, we're calibrating our model uh, uh, using, using the materials that we generate, and then we are using prediction models, uh, using marker effects to select, and therefore, if we select based on markers, will that exhaust our genetic diversity a lot more quickly than if we do phenotypic selection? So Amy Jacobson and I investigated uh, what's the effect of genome-wide predictions on diversity. Uh, we found that uh, for biparental crosses, the mean similarity among any two lines was 0.52, whereas the maximum similarity between any two lines was 0.71. We found that if we select based on phenotypic selection, the best 5%, the mean similarity among those lines increased hardly from 0.52 to 0.53. And then the question is, well, if we select based on genome-wide markers, where would that be? Would the similarity be way here to the right? Will it be the middle? Or way, way, will it be just slightly increased? And we found that if we select based on genome-wide markers, yes, there is an increase in the similarity, but it is not bad as we thought. We're certainly not near this 0.71. And actually, the 0.71 is a bit misleading because this is for pairwise similarity, but we're looking at the similarity among the best 5%. And if we look at the maximum similarity among the 5%, it's actually 0.68. So why would that be? Well, it is because, because of linkage, we're actually not finding that very best combination of, of, of marker effects, if you would, or marker alleles in any given line. Again, because of linkage, it's not like we can cherry pick uh, those markers and assemble them in a given line. And it's because of that that we are not approaching this maximum similarity that we are afraid of. So it's a bit, a bit of a concern, but not as much as we might have thought. Uh, still, that thought comes to mind, though, that if we select based on genome-wide markers, then the individuals that we phenotype are already a selected set. And if we use the phenotyped individuals as training populations for future germplasm, are we, by selection, compromising the effectiveness of genome-wide selection for future generation, generations or for future populations? So Sophie Brander is then looked at what is the effect of selection on the accuracy or the response to future genome-wide uh, genome selection. Meaning that, for example, for yield, if we select based on phenotypic selection, based on selection, I'm sorry, based on, if we, if we select 100% and use this 100% for the future training population, the mean uh, increase was 0.22 megagrams per hectare. Again, this is not correlations, the correlations here are on the right. If 50% are selected, and those 50% are used for future training populations, then the future effectiveness decreases numerically, but, but not significantly. However, if we select 25%, which is perhaps the more typical uh, proportion selected, if we select the best 25% and use those 25% for future predictions, we're actually compromising future response. And you may ask the question, well, how much of that is due to selection and how much of that is due to, uh, to the, just the change in, in the smaller N? And by the way, that result was found for other traits. And again, we're concerned with this effect of selecting only 25%. Uh, Sophie found that if we use 50% 50, 50 or 25% random in this case, not selected, but random, now, if we're selecting for random here, then the response went back up. 
meaning that yes, it's the actual selection and not just the decrease in the size of the training populations that is compromising future gains. We then said, well, what if instead of just selecting the best, we select the best, but we also select a few of the poorest, say five poorest, and include those five poorest in, uh, in, in, in phenotyping so that future generations would have a mix of what we have selected, but also a few of those that we actually know to think are poor. And what that does is it also provides a check on the effectiveness of, of uh, the genome-wide prediction in the first place. And we found that if we do that, simply by adding five of the poorest in individuals, then the effectiveness of genome-wide selection in future generations goes back up. So what we recommend then is for, to maintain future progress that yes, we select based on genome-wide markers, but we select also a few of the poorest ones and include that in phenotyping and include that in future training populations uh, to maintain selection gains in future generations. Uh, a student and I, Josh Sleeper, looked at, well, how about can we use these uh, markers then genome-wide marker effects for correlated traits. Can we use genome-wide markers to, to, to separate, say, yield into a, a portion that is uncorrelated with other traits and a portion that is correlated with other traits such as moisture and height? And in our thinking, well, if we can do that, if we can partition yield into a, an uncorrelated portion and a portion correlated with other traits, we can focus only on this correlation and have gains that are independent of this portion that is correlated with the other traits. So uh, uh, Josh did that and we're thankful for the support from his employer uh, Syngenta to do this. In the end, we found that it did not work. This procedure did not work and in hindsight, which is 2020, it did not work because although we were able to, at least statistically, partition the, the variation into these two components, in practice, well, those were still linked with each other in, on the chromosomes and in the actual corn plants we're working with. And because of this physical actual linkage, even though statistically we can try to uh, uncouple that from each other, in, in, in actual meiosis and actual selection, we were unable uh, to do that. Uh, Josh also investigated, what, what about haplotypes in prediction? What if, for example, we now investigate genome-wide prediction, not in biparental crosses, but in crosses that involve three parents? And because they involve three parents, we know that there could be up to three alleles per locus, given that these parents are homozygous. So Josh investigated, what if we use just a simple, naive, biallelic model for SNPs? We don't treat it any differently. Or it, what if we uh, use two, uh, two methods, a marker interval and allele facing, that allow us then to determine multiple alleles uh, <clears throat> for, for SNP loci? Josh found that, well, it doesn't make a difference. At least in these maze crosses, uh, three parent, it doesn't, did not make a difference whether we used a biallelic marker for the SNPs or whether we used multi-allelic models to treat these SNP data. And again, uh, the culprit here we found was the strong LD among the molecular markers. And the way we concluded that is, well, we did some simulations and did six generations of random mating to, to break these linkages. And we found that, well, if you random mate for several generations, then when the LD is low, surely enough, there's a distinct advantage with using uh, multiple allele models with biallelic uh, models. So again, it all depends on how much LD you have in the population you're working with. Uh, Nick Ames uh, and I were working now more on the uh, another aspect. Can we use genome-wide markers to reduce the number of locations in first-year testing? And again, the idea here is what if at the normal procedure is we phenotype at seven locations, but what if we have prior process and we have genome-wide predictions? Can we use these genome-wide predictions to reduce the number of locations that we use in first-year phenotypic selection? 
And so from uh, analytical results and cross-validation methods, we found that yes, you can do that. And the results vary by trait. Uh, we found that these GCA model predictions are on average uh, equivalent to about one location for yield, two locations for moisture, three locations for test weight out of three or four total uh, locations. And there was quite a bit of variation among populations and among traits. And so if you use this procedure, then you must be prepared to accept that, again, uh, you, you, the value of the predictions uh, does vary and you're not in a way, uh, it, it, it's not an equal, uh, it's not an equal substitution across all the populations and traits uh, that you're working with. It's quite a bit of work uh, that I've summarized in about an hour. And if I were to summarize the three main learnings that we've had from this uh, quarter century of genome-wide prediction, here's what I would say. First is we know that genome-wide selection works on average. There are times it works really well. There are times it doesn't work at all. If we use it routinely, it works on average. And that is no different from phenotypic selection. Phenotypic selection works on average. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. However, if we use phenotypic selection, it, it works on average. And we have found for each of our different species what regimes for phenotypic selection work. And also, we've, I think we've found uh, for a different species and trait, well, what, what procedures work specifically for those situations. A key, I believe, is to use phenotypic selection, is, I'm sorry, to use genome-wide predictions when phenotypic selection is least effective, meaning that in a breeding program, you'd have to identify, first of all, what are those stages in the breeding program when phenotypic selection actually doesn't work, or it is too time-consuming, or uh, it is too labor-intensive, uh, or uh, it is too costly. And third, I think a key learning we've had is that really it's relatedness is key, relatedness between the training population and the test population. And that should come as no surprise, given the equivalence between GBLUP and say procedures like ridge regression BLUP, GBLUP or genomic BLUP is all driven by relatedness. And without that relatedness, uh, the predictions, we should not be surprised the predictions uh, should not work. So with that, thank you uh, for joining me today. I'd be happy to answer questions uh, that you may have. I think there are some questions uh, that are already, uh, that have been uh, <clears throat> sent to me by chat. I'll see if I can go through them and how much time we have to do so. <clears throat> can you establish a point where we say that the cost per gain for doing genome-wide selection is better than phenotyping? Uh, the answer is that with many things, it, it, it depends. It depends. It's simply something, it's, it's, it's the procedure is something that you'd have to do uh, in your breeding program uh, and gain by experience how it works best. Uh, obviously, you can do simulation studies, uh, you can do um, different what if kinds of scenarios. And, and, and you indicate a, a good point. It depends on the costs for phenotyping and the costs for genotyping. And so again, it just, just, just depends on costs and it's something that would vary uh, from case to case. And those types of studies are needed. Uh, so yes, do a proof of concept, but after you do that, see uh, how you can implement the procedure uh, routinely in your breeding program. Is re if relatedness, is there a minimum size of a trustful training set? Um, I, I, the, the first study, the first study uh, of GBLOP that I did, the first ever GBLOP study in two in 1994, it had 55 individuals. So I was able to show that, yeah, with 55 individuals, it works. That being said, that was a nicely created data set in which everything was balanced. Uh, you had strong relatedness. So, so yes, there is a minimum size. And I would say the minimum size, if you have strong relatedness is e even a hundred or so uh, should be strong enough. Of course, the answer is you want it as large as possible. What, okay, what do you think the effect of genome-wide prediction will have on the genetic gain curve? Uh, compared to other other decades? Oh, that's a good, great question. I don't know what it is because it is confounded with other things, right? It's confounded 
not, it's, 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 it's not just a function of the selection procedure, but all the things uh, that, that, that come into, into play, the, the availability of technology uh, and so forth. So uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the genetic uh, uh, gain curve is. That being said though, I, I think that we are now at the point, um, just to take a step back, for, for us to be successful in breeding, it's a three-legged stool and we need three things. We need good germplasm, we need good breeders, and we need good tools and resources. Tools and resources, breeding organizations uh, would pretty much be using the same methods. Breeders, uh, breeding organizations, I believe all have or could have, could have all, uh, all have good breeders. What would differentiate the breeding organizations then is the germplasm. And so if I were looking to the future, I would not be focusing on the actual method, but I would look at, be looking more at the genetic diversity, the pool of germplasm that we can work with. And it actually raises the question, how can we use genome-wide markers to better use the germplasm that we have? And that's actually a work, a piece of, uh, a theme of research uh, that I'm working with uh, right now. Comparison of K and QK model. Um, does that mean? Okay, it's between a Q and QK model. Accounting for uh, population structure with a K model works only, only if the subpopulations vary in their mean performance. The K in that model only accounts for mean performance of the populations. So if my, popul my subpopulations are, uh, say, uh, popcorn and uh, dent corn, and my trait is popping expansion, yes, population structure would account for that. But if I have popcorn and dent corn, and my trait is chlorophyll content, and my dent corn and popcorn have the same chlorophyll content, then including K in the model would not make or should not make any difference whatsoever. Uh, how do Bayesian models differ from rich regression? Zero effect. Maybe a, a random forest has, uh, RKHS has a very, very small effect. Uh, but in the third edition of my textbook, I guess I'm putting a plug here, of uh, reading for quantitative traits in plants. There's an entire new chapter on the use of genome-wide markers uh, with mixed models. And I, what I did was summarize different procedures, looking at Bayesian models, looking at machine learning, comparing it to GBLOP and rich regression blob. And the conclusion is rich regression blob Bayes and, and, and GBLOP work really, really well, are very robust, and the Bayesian models really do not make uh, my, uh, make uh, any difference. Gain on the NIRS, how often was the NIRS recalibrated? It was not recalibrated. It was done only one time at the start of the breeding uh, process. And yes, uh, we did not calibrate it. I guess in hindsight, uh, we could have, we should have done that. That would have been interesting to do. Uh, but within the constraints of time, um, uh, we could not do that. But that raises a question if you're working on uh, cellulosic uh, working on any a trait that require that does NIRS, if you're changing the profiles by selection, then you need to be concerned that those NIRS calibrations might not be good uh, anymore. Will it be efficient to run GS with genome resequencing data with 20 million SNPs? It depends on the context uh, for biparental crosses. The answer is no, not at all. Uh, you could you could very well get by uh, with markers that are spaced 10 centimorgans apart or five centimorgans apart. And again, it's because large chunks of a chromosome are passed intact from parent to offspring. So if I have a test population of 300 individuals, 20 million markers would not do me any good. Most of those 20 million markers would be extremely redundant with each other. In fact, you need to pair that down so that they're not uh, completely redundant uh, with each other. On you, okay, next question, using genome-wide prediction in advanced cultivar trials, not as important in my opinion. Once you get yield data, then the, the mark, the, the value of genome-wide predictions decreases because then 
when you use phenotypic data and genome-wide predictions in some combined sort of index, then most of your information would come from phenotyping, assuming your phenotyping is good. Uh, differences in whole crop relationships. Uh, Will this hold the 25 plus five, will it hold from crops that are more highly related or have a less diverse base? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but that is, a, that is an easy enough uh, uh, project to do. Again, this point, selecting 25 and 25 plus five. So if you're working with a species with a more narrow genetic base, say soybean, uh, yes, that should be an easy study to do and could, could make for a nice paper and a nice thesis uh, project, actually. Where can I get that textbook? Uh, it is available uh, from stemmapress.com, S-T-E-M-M-A press.com. Uh, it can be purchased online. Am I working on other learning methods? Uh, no. I'm, so the question is, I mentioned random forests, am I working on other on methods? No. Uh, actually, the, the larger answer to the question is, uh, I have two students who are finishing their work on genome-wide prediction, but I have, I'm getting a bit tired of the topic, and I have decided that I'd be moving on to other things of investigation and, and leaving genome-wide predictions a bit behind me. Uh, the, my current area of investigation is targeted recombination, which does use genome-wide prediction, but it's a different way, it's a different focus. It's trying to see where should we have recombination in the genome to increase uh, genetic gain. Epigenomics for GS, no, I have not done that. Um, will using a test error be more accurate? Uh, I'm sorry, I do not understand that question. Um, I'm looking at the time and we are past, it's 1132. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, participation today. These are very engaging questions. It's wonderful to see uh, the number of participants who, who joined. I think we were at a high of about 250 participants at a given point. Uh, it shows that even in the midst of a COVID-9 pandemic that we are able to effectively share uh, information uh, again, I'm very grateful for, uh, for the input and, and, and your engagement. Again, this started with a class of, of less than 20 and to, to see that and to uh, see this response is quite, in, is, is quite encouraging. And perhaps this is something uh, that we can do again in the future. I see greetings from uh, different people that I know, including former students uh, and, and friends. So, so thank you so much. I'll leave the chat on in case you want to put more uh, <laughs> greetings, but uh, that I'm going to officially adjourn our meeting. Thanks for joining me. Uh, be safe, be healthy, and be well. Thank you so much.